Welcome to Conservation Conversations with me, Sarah Mohan. Today we're speaking with Dr. Ullas Karanth of the Wildlife Conservation Society and we're talking about wildlife in India, the past, the present and the future. Dr. Karanth, we usually tend to think of the past as this golden age for wildlife, but how do you compare wildlife abundance in India from when you were a boy to now? I think this golden age in the past is a myth. Uh, Fifty years ago, when I was a teenager and going to college, I thought uh, there'll be no wildlife left in India because all around me in the Malnad landscape of Karnataka, tigers were being shot, the last tigers were being shot, forests were being cleared uh, for agriculture, logging was rampant and there was no protection and there were no laws to protect wildlife. So everything seemed bleak and lost. Today the same landscape has more than 400 tigers, wildlife has come back big time. Uh, there are problems, but I never thought I would see this recovery, which, which I have seen. And uh, one of the things with conservation is the younger generation of conservationists have not seen that bleak scenario before and they think all these parks where you walk in and see wildlife is what it has been and there was a golden age in the past when it was even better. No, it wasn't. Maybe thousands of years ago, but not, not in any recent memory. So what do you attribute this success and this change, this positive change to? Uh, the change started in the 60s with a pioneer generation of conservationists, uh, Salim Ali, EPG, M. Krishnan and others like them, uh, they all started pleading the cause of wildlife. And in the late 60s, when Mrs. Indira Gandhi came to power, they finally had a prime minister with whom these views resonated. She was a very well-informed person with a deep knowledge of the history and culture and natural history of the country and she saw sense in the argument that something had to be done. So the first element was this influence from conservationists. Second was Indira Gandhi herself was a very determined, a powerful politician. She put in some strong laws and made sure they got implemented at state and center. Both she controlled at one point in time politically. And the third element of this was with all the laws, uh, you need people to implement them. And fortunately, the British had set up the forestry service in India as a law enforcement agency with a command structure, certain level of obedience. And once the laws were put in place, the forest officers did a tremendous job, particularly at the lower level of guards and rangers and so forth. They did a tremendous job facing incredible odds to stop hunting and bring back wildlife. So it was these three elements that made the difference, say, between late 60s, particularly early 70s, well into the 80s. That was the real period when the entire thing shifted. Right. So then now can we say that we have perhaps achieved an optimum level of wildlife protection and conservation? Oh, we cannot say that we are now at an optimal stage at all. Once again, using the tiger as an example, we have 300,000 square kilometers of potential habitat where tigers can live. Only 10% of that is effectively protected and tigers are at reasonable densities. So there's a long way to go. And this is the same case with many other species, whether it's snow leopards in the mountains, great Indian bustard and the wolf in the arid zones. We have a long, long way to go. But the plus side of it is that unlike in the 60s when the country was poor and desperate, today we have the resources. What we sometimes lack is the wisdom and the practical knowledge and the science, it's doable now. It wasn't, it was very iffy in the 60s. Mm. So you also often talk about a mission drift in the forest department. Can you tell us a bit more about that? As I mentioned, the forest department's mandate originally was to protect the forest land from agricultural expansion and to log it sustainably. That was its mandate. So the mandate to protect wildlife came in the early 70s and the generation of foresters who protected wildlife and established some of our finest sanctuaries, people like Kaila Sankla, H.S. Pawar, uh, Sanjay Debroy, K.M. Chinnapa, these were all ground level people. They knew law enforcement. They knew what needed to be done and they were pragmatists 
rooted in the soil. Over time, what has happened is the Forestry Service has gotten elevated into a bureaucratic service like IAS. And focus on ground level protection has been replaced by too much top-down planning, too much emphasis on gizmos, too much emphasis on uh, so-called smart ideas. So, uh, and this has led to some kind of a mission drift. There are still excellent people who are actually doing protection. But as a whole, if you look at the proportion, uh, that proportion of effective on-ground people has shrunk. I call this the mission drift. Right. And uh, what do you see as the greatest threats to wildlife in India today? If you look at the country as a whole, uh, you see that wildlife is effectively protected in a very small fraction of the land. Uh, as I said, maybe 30,000 square kilometers in a country of 3 million square kilometers. So it's a really small fraction. And even this is very patchy. It is in the Western Ghats, a little bit in central India, in Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra, a little bit in Assam and in uh, Terai, in Uttarakhand and places like that. In many other parts of the country, particularly northeast and eastern India and uh, the tribal belts of central India, wildlife is being wiped out. So hunting is still the biggest threat in my opinion. Even in the well-protected areas, commercial hunting for ivory and tigers is a threat. The second threat is that uh, the forest base has shrunk and although logging has come down dramatically, earlier logging used to be a very big threat, extraction of other forest products, biomass, grazing, bamboo, uh, NTFV, these are at, going on at unsustainable levels and degrading the habitat. So this is the second pressure that's mostly originating from the rural sector, fires, things of this nature. Uh, the third new threat has been with the accelerated development um, things like mines and even so-called green energy projects, uh, highways, they have all started fragmenting the habitat. So there's a whole set of threats still. Right. So then given our thirst for faster development and better infrastructure, how does one expect to hold on to what we have, let alone expand on previous conservation successes? I think it's still possible, surprising it may seem, because as I said, right now, this strictly protected part of uh, India that is devoted to nature is less than 5%. I think it can easily be pushed up to 10 or 15%. If we can hold on to 10 or 15% of the land as nature reserves, key watersheds, that still leaves 80 to 85% of the land for development, for industry, for agriculture, for other activities that can sustain the economic growth. I don't see it as a contradiction. I see it as a way we manage the landscape sustainably and smartly. That really is the challenge rather than saying there's an absolute limit and we can't grow anymore. I think there's plenty of room for both if we are smart about it. So then how strong is the economic argument for preserving forests and wildlife? And do you reckon decision makers and planners even care about things like ecosystem services, heritage um, and rights of uh, wildlife? I think the decision makers are conflicted because often what we do is we try to achieve all these goals on the same piece of land. And I think that's wrong. I think we need to have areas that are earmarked to serve ecosystem functions earmarked to protect nature and areas earmarked for intensive agriculture, intensive energy production, industrialization and urbanization. So to me, uh, saying we don't want growth is not an answer anymore. The question is, how can we turn that growth into a positive force for conservation? It can in many ways. Uh, one of the things that this entire development process does is to shift the population uh, towards urbanization, away from land-based, uh, biomass-based occupations and economies towards manufacturing service sector. That creates opportunities for uh, making more room for nature. Secondly, uh, economic growth brings with it cultural changes. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, hunting cultures that were widespread uh, consumption of wild uh, meat for meeting basic protein needs. These are all waning in many parts of the country which have seen development. There's farm-raised protein is substituting wildlife that was hunted. 
uh, entertainment, social entertainment has moved from hunting to watching cricket or movies. So many of these uh, traditional ways of uh, uh, living off the land are giving way and that again creates scope for conservation. So I see growth as a dangerous thing to conservation, but also it has its positive sides that we should be able to exploit. So then you do believe that there is hope for India's uh, wildlife and forests in the long run then? Absolutely, I believe there is hope because my own 50 years of uh, evidence that I have from the time I was a teenager to now, uh, I see that many parts of the country, including the one where I have been working for professionally for the last 25 years or 30 years, wildlife has come back big time. In an area like coastal Karnataka, where you would not find a single peacock, there was no wildlife, today you can see animals coming back into habitat. So I, I don't see wildlife as a write-off at all in India. Right. Well, thanks so much for speaking with us today.